Could we have the roll call? <clears throat> Barbara Craig? Here. John Jenkins? Here. Russ Wynn? Here. Chairwoman McCurdy? Yes. Chris Corey? Here. Jesse Perdon? Alan Horowitz? Here. All right. I call for approval of the minutes of January 14th committee approve, meeting. Approve. Second. Second. John? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Minutes are approved. I believe you all received recommended changes or comments on the city charter. Uh, these comments came when uh, Arlene and I met with uh, three <coughs> or four members of the uh, council individually and they gave suggestions that they thought might be relevant to the charter review. So there are some that uh, I've looked over and it looked like to me were uh, city attorney uh, responsibilities. If you'd look at section 13C, 15B, and 29, section 29. And I'd like to know if that's all right to uh, do this with the city attorney or do you feel that we're, or you are competent to uh, discuss this without that? And Chair, I'd also like to add that additionally, we did get some emailed comments from committee members and we incorporated those comments into this list as well. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. We, um, uh, we had um, uh, yeah, committee uh, Corey. Four, uh, five of these are mine, so I had sent. Oh, them. I didn't know that. And they're, and they're, but they were also duplicate of some that some of some of them were received during our individual meetings too. So we included both. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Um, I guess the question I have is certainly I think we need to discuss all of these. Many of them will be have questions for the attorneys. Do you want to just start at the beginning and talk with them, or do all the attorney ones first and then? Well, I just thought we should have his input on that before we have a big discussion, and that we could put those at the end, you know, maybe for the next meeting. Well, I, I actually have seen, seen you have questions. done I've seen them, them, so uh, at least the three that were listed for the attorney. So I can, do you want to take things in order just for simplicity's sake? I can address yes. them as we come to them. Yes. Mm -hmm. That would make things easier for did you uh, check the ordinance for on the supermajority on height oh. about adding that to the charter? Uh, it can be are added to the charter. Very similar provisions are contained in other in other codes, including I believe the city of Naples. Has Naples a also. Um, there has been some case law on the supermajority requirement. It, it is simply a, a question of whether or not it's appropriate in the charter or whether it should be something that's appropriate as a matter of land development code. My so it's more appropriateness rather than it is whether it can be legally achieved. Yes, it can be legally achieved. But is it appropriate? Is that, that what the discussion? I think, that, I think that's really where it ends up, it yeah. ends up being because the, the issue of and when it comes to charter, and I'm, I'm speaking at this point a little bit with a, a policy hat on, it's, it's fairly uncommon for communities to put land development regulations into their charters. Right. Uh, you know, charter is dealing with your form of government, some procedural issues, the manner of elections. When, when you start to put land use provisions in, there's, there's a there's an open question how that will be interpreted when a court reviews it. Um, courts will look at land development regulations and your comprehensive plan based on all the case law surrounding those issues. They will read your charter basically as a charter and they will apply the same rec regulatory uh, analysis and if they find it insufficient, they'll strike it down. And you're not in a position to modify it quickly like you would be with your right. land development regulations. Right, that's the that, main that, thing. You know, that's to me is the major issue and I've heard this talked about at the council too about should we make a requirement for supermajority to change the height restriction because that has been a hugely controversial issue mm -hmm. every time it's come up 
And the advantage of putting that into the charter is a, a simple majority of this year's council can't change that. The other thing that seems to me that is important to think about when you think about a charter is it is the people that make that decision. That's what the point of a charter revision is, is to have the voice of the people be heard on issues that they really care about. And I think if you look at the last ones that you sent to us, which I appreciate, or whoever sent the ones last time with the votes on them, you'll notice that all the ones that lost had to do with the people with wanting to control, to have the, um, the controls that are already in place stay there over action by the council that might be um, done um, with a very fleeting majority, I guess is what they use. In <laughs> but so to me, this is the kind of thing, and I agree really with Derek, that you don't want to put everything in your land use code or a whole bunch of stuff in there. That would be, um, you know, just clutter up your charter and make it hard to change things that ought to be changed. But to the extent that the citizens of Bonita Springs have as strong a position as they've seemed to have about height restrictions, that they don't want to become Miami floated over, they want to keep 75 the highest, that seems to me the sort of thing that ought, they ought to have an opportunity to speak on, and that's why you have a something changed in the charter so that the people can speak. So my reaction to that is, I don't know. I'm a, I don't have my ear to the ground of all the people in Bonita Springs whether it would pass or not. But based on what I've seen at council meetings over the last several years, I would say that's something that the population or a large piece of it cares rather passionately about. Well, and I want to be. I want to give a. I want to give an example of a situation where putting something in the charter could come back to bite the city. That's not a dispute about whether there should be a height limitation, and so, and I'll, I'll pick any height you want. But let's assume that that height allows for three three stories over flood elevation today. And last year, the Florida Building Code changed to say that. You have to add an additional fit, foot of freeboard above your base flood elevation. Only well, we can imagine in a future t time period, we put a hard and fast rule on height limitations, and then there's additional changes saying that now all buildings have to build to a higher standard. In order to change the charter, you, gotta have you, you, you might you might not be able to, to explain that adequately to the electorate in order to get the majority necessary to change the charter. And you might end up in a situation where you might be divesting numerous properties of significant entitlements, one floor possibly, and where a simple change that would allow for um, three floors above base flood elevation, any you know, tweaking of language in the land development code or even the comp plan would allow you to have some flexibility. A charter provision would require that referendum on the issue and tie you possibly in the city into a number of lawsuits on that issue that no one intended when they set the height limitation, but once it was set, it was so difficult to adjust it. And what would be the basis of a legal challenge? Well, I, I'm, I'm giving you an example. It, it all has to depend on what the, the height restrictions would entail. But let's say you had a multifamily district and you had multiple multifamily districts, possibly some of them which are a half approved, so phase one is approved, but phase two isn't approved, and you have a height limitation in your code, which uh, is obviously maybe a lot more voluminous and might have exceptions and considerations for architectural features and other things, but you have a provision in your charter that's very simple, 75 feet, no more. And then there is a third party, state comes in, says you gotta adjust your height elevations or they have to be measured. Legislature could also say, you now have to measure height from a different perspective that might conflict with your code. You can't make that change, but you're forced because of your charter to deny additional entitlements. Numer numerous property owners file a lawsuit against the city. The city can't, if, if only changing the language to add an extra foot would get the city out of multi-million dollar lawsuits, it can't do it because it requires a charter amendment and, and the city is prevented from spending too much money or certain amounts of money on electioneering communications to try and convince people of the value of changing the chart. Would, I, so I, that's, I mean, yeah, this is a yeah. huge hypothetical. Yeah, I know. It may never occur, <laughs> but I, I want to point I out just the inflexibility of charter provisions. Sure. 
The thing I would ask about that is, what would be the basis of a lawsuit that you had a right to have three stories if the, if the code said you had 75 feet and now 75 feet only gives you two stories or two and a half stories or whatever? Well, if where you, would you find the legal sure, right to do that? The, the most expedient legal uh, uh, action would be a Burt Harris lawsuit. And Burt Harris is based well, on. Well, I know, I've heard yeah, Burt Harris. But so. Burt, ha Burt Harris, I like to call takings light under the Florida Constitution and the U.S. Constitution to deprive someone of their property rights based on a regulatory taking basically means they can't do anything with the property. Bert Harris turns that on its head by saying it's only the reasonable investment-backed expectations of the property owner that matter. So what is the reasonable investment-backed expectations of a property owner? Perhaps they bought thinking they could build three stories or four stories, whatever, under the 75-foot limit. All the neighboring properties are, and now suddenly they can only build to one two-thirds of that. The language of the Burt Harris Act would possibly give them a claim of action against the city. The controlling word there, I think, is possibly, but okay. Possibly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I mean, me it's, a stretch, it, but okay. it's the point is, it's not the yeah. what were the reasonable investment back expectations, but for the city's action. No, it's what are the reasonable investment back expectations of the property owner. In that case, it could be seventy-five feet or three stories. It depends on how it's written. The Charter Amendment is it. Three stories. Is it, how is, is it, how it written it in our current? I mean, we do have these the 75 limit in mm. in um, places around town. We have lower limits, 45, and other places. Uh, how is it written in our land use codes now? I can't remember which w w the specific language, but can't you change the land use code? That's, that's, my, that's very my point. simply the, the land use in front of the council. Yeah, and that's the argument for putting it in the charter to make it harder. I mean, this is the argument that has been made in front of the council that the reason to put this into a charter or into something like the com comprehensive plan rather than simply the land use is it's harder to change that. So, to the extent that you want um, a sort of a simple fleeting majority that, um, with the potential of pressure on them to give in to something that the the citizens were against. This makes it harder for that to happen. But it's never been my understanding that you have the expectation of what you can do with your property from what you thought when you bought it, because lots of regulations happen and things change. And we have, at least to my knowledge, we have never said that the state's ability or the city's ability to regulate land use um, ends at your purchase. You can't make any changes. And as long as you're making changes that are in the public interest, it strikes me that you can, well, yeah. Let me, let me give you the uh, uh, side example. What if you have a, a multi-phase project? That phase has been vested and entitled. Could you speak up? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What, what if you have a multi-phase project, which has, you know, especially when you're talking about large towers, something like that, it takes, there's a, there's a development timetable that takes years to build, and they've got their entitlements effectively from the city to that height, to the building plans and everything. And then what I'm suggesting here it's not a city-initiated change that causes the problem. It's from an, another regulatory agency. But it isn't the state that's denying the building permits. It would be the city. Um, and there, there's, there's pretty good case law on situations where, um, say, the, the Department of Environmental Protection or other state laws work in concert with local government laws to deny development rights. But it is the local government who is the one saying no and it is the local government who then pays the tab. I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not saying yep. you can't do it. I'm All right, we're going to have to, you know, yeah, hear from on. somebody else about this, too. Does anybody else have? Yes. I, I just have a question, and pardon my ignorance, maybe I just don't understand. But is this Burger Dot referring to two separate things? Are they talking about a supermajority at the council vote and also separately a change in the charter? No. Cause I, the the language that, that I that I read these these points to see, is it possible to add a supermajority vote for height and other uh, in the charter, oh, and yeah. other land development issues such as zoning, okay. as a supermajority. So rule. it's referring and, to the charter. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> but the answer is yes on all sides. You could do land for use land, amendments for land zoning. Use. And it would seem to me that the measuring rod ought to be. How important is this to the people that you would want to have that? But the people the have something important all the time. And to put a supermajority for every issue 
It doesn't that, say for every issue. It no, no, but I'm saying yeah. this happens all the time. Well, and you can't just put, for land use, they'll be putting super majorities for they everything. Can, they well, can actually do that simply in an ordinance, I would assume, already. But this is, the question here, it seems to me, is not whether a 75-foot height is a sensible height or not. That's what we have in the land use code now as the maximum, other than if you have been, um, find your right to a higher building somewhere else. Uh, we know mm -hmm. annexation agreements being one of them. Um, but if you, if, if that is a compelling enough um, rule that we want in the city of Bonita Springs, that's the kind of thing you, that might, ought to go in the charter. For every land development zoning law, surely you wouldn't want to do that. Those have to be much more flexible. And I guess so the bottom line about this question, is the height restriction a critical enough um, issue to warrant being in the charter? That's, I don't know the answer to that, well, but I think it's worth I, I I'll suggest there's a, the city council doesn't, also doesn't have to take the rec recommendation. Well, so, right. So, yeah. you know, it's ultimately this will boil down to a less than a supermajority vote. Yes. A, and yeah. uh, yeah. non referendum. So there's no harm in asking and putting yeah. it forward. <laughs> the the council's going to always say no. John, but I'm do just you have saying, anything? Well, I just, I worry a little bit about the complexity of this issue in terms of a charter amendment. Um, you know, we know, just looking around locally, we know we've got an issue with the towers in Raptor Bay, or you may have an issue with the form-based code and what that's gonna end up looking like and where, and you've got issues with development in the DRGR. Um, you know, these are all issues that can be addressed and are in the, you know, in the land use code, but, uh, or land development code, but I just think once you start trying to anticipate or people are trying to understand what limitations or permissions are finding their way into the charter with some of these issues out there that um, we're gonna have our hands full in terms of the complexity and trying to decide what does go in and how um, if, if we go with a, um, consider putting that in the charter and understand your yeah. comment about how, how permanent do you wanna make it or okay. how easy do you want it? should it be changed in terms of is it a land development code or a charter type issue? Russ? Aren't these issues dealt with in the uh, zoning committee? I mean, whenever people wanting to uh, develop property, um, I mean, it seems like um, those are issues that come before the zoning. But the zoning only recommends. It doesn't the zoning only recommends. Yeah. It doesn't decide. Right, so. exactly. So it's the council, and that's where the, the yeah. supermajority issue the would come back yeah. to play, play in there. <clears throat> well, I'm not that familiar with the issue, but I mean, for example, in Washington, D.C., buildings can't exceed a certain height, and it's been that way for it's 100 years. the capital. Years. <laughs> the capital. So, you know, how, how do they, I mean, there's lots of investment property in, in, in Washington, D.C., so it seems to me that there must be a way to do it. Uh, I don't know that it's in their charter, the Washington, D.C. charter. It's a federal charter, I guess. But uh, how does Naples do it? Does Naples put it in the charter? Well, it says here Naples and possibly Collier do this. Where does That's that come it. from? Collier also requires a supermajority vote for rezonings. Collier, I believe Naples has it not only in their charter, but they have explanatory provisions in their code, which often, in fact, I've got one project conflict. Yeah. yeah. And you're trying, and then and then there's back back ending, and I actually started. You have to talk into the microphone. Sorry, I, my, my my voice is gone too. I'm getting over a really bad cold, but. Just the, bring your the, microphone the, closer. The charter in Naples has charter provisions and they have height limitations in their code. And they often run into conflict with each other or which one interprets which. Um, Collier has a supermajority requirement for rezonings, but not conditional approval. So like a special exception, or a bear, that's where they, they keep the, the lower level. Um, St. Petersburg also has a, a height limitation in, a, in their charter. Um, I started out as a, a land use attorney in Washington, D.C., so the, the process they had to get around the height limitations in D.C. were transfer development rights. So they moved entitlement, they moved, you sold your height to somebody else to, that was, so they had a relief mechanism sort of built into they the They do that the in New York also. Yeah, they do that in a lot of places, but then of course you go across the, the, across the Potomac and Roslyn, Virginia is just towering buildings overlooking it. So. 
The answer is you can put it in your charter. All, all I am suggesting is as a cautionary is the way you put it in is to be very clear about how you want it to be interpreted um, because once something goes in, it's unlikely to go out. And if, if, if we see development build out at some point in the future where the things get, there's a change in the, in the public, it may take a lot to, to move that for whatever reason, whether regulatory or otherwise. So if your flood plain changes. There's nothing we can do about that. That's, that's, now, a, that's an external change. If the flood plain yeah. changes and you're to build so many, you know, have a, a thing above the flood plain mm -hmm. and that changes your height, right? Correct. So that would have to be... That would have to be voted on with a supermajority. You couldn't do anything with your property. Right. No, you could before. You, you would just do less. You just you can't go. The flood plan. You can't do it. And, and, and then you have the, the situation which does occur from time to time. When it comes to flood prone areas, you want to try and encourage people to develop to the current standards, not to try and grandfather their project in in order to get maximum entitlements while putting people at risk. So. You generally want to be able to adjust with that flood elevation. I don't know how you would do that in their charter. I just we probably could, but that would be something to think about. That's all. So is that something we could ask Naples? How if they've run into any problem like that? They certainly develop a lot. So. Uh, I've dealt with the issue with Naples a couple of times. I'll talk to the city okay. attorney. I'd like to ask another question. Um, I'm going to be on the hierarchy of laws. It would seem to me that we know that the zoning rules are at one level. The a comprehensive plan is that another isn't the charter the highest in terms of if you had a conflict between the charter and a regulation wouldn't the charter be the one that would control mm -hmm. like the Constitution yeah. I suppose is what you would yes and no the Florida law is the state statutes regarding municipal government control over our charter control over local government land development regulations are, and our ordinances. Like any state law does. And you have a considerable body of statutory uh, laws and case law interpreting and defining the boundaries of zoning regulations, interpretations of heights and other things. When you're looking at your charter, you may, you're looking at it only as our charter. There's nothing else to go on. So for instance, in a, in a comprehensive plan in Florida, is, is viewed as inviolable. The language is strictly construed to be in, in compliance or not. You cannot issue a development order or any kind of permit that's in conflict with your comprehensive plan. But that has been established by both state law and numerous courts establishing that standard. That standard would not apply to our charter. Our charter would be read as any other in, in the view of statutory con construction. And so it could be subject to interpretation. So if you're really trying to like make it absolutely clear, you would put it in the comprehensive plan. But All right, that's now a we'll go on document. to someone else. Okay. Do you have any comment? I, I, I just have a question, maybe I just don't understand, but if the issue is, if you have a 75 foot height limit, for example, and your floodplain changes, why can't you just state it as 75 feet above existing floodplain, so if the state changes the floodplain level, well, because it's not necessarily the floodplain level that changed. So last year when the Florida Building Code was amended, it didn't change the elevation, the flood elevation. What it required was an additional foot of freeboard, basically, of, of space to be built above that. And that wasn't anticipated. Oh. So, you know, when you, it'd be, I'd be concerned about tying it to something like that because that could be reinterpreted, it could be redefined by the legislature, it could be, it could be changed in all, multiple different ways. And, that, and that's really the only comment I have is, it, once you put it in your charter, it's there. It's going to be very difficult to adjust or remove to deal with circ changing circumstances, and we don't know what those circumstances could be. Well, you will uh, talk to the Naples people in regard to this. And the we the will city attorney just retired, but I'll, I, I'll call him on his cell phone, I'm sure. He's been, he was there 20-plus years. I'm sure he's dealt with the issue. Brett, For a week or two, he'll yeah. be bored. He'll talk to Yeah. <laughs> he will know <laughs> with that. All right, we will discuss this further after we get here from the attorney. Section 7. <coughs> Should historical information that has expired be included 
i.e. page 17, section 7, quote, for the period of five years for the date the city has was created, unquote. And this comment came from some feedback we received during our one-on-one -on -one meetings that there is some references that actually tell the historical story of how the charter moved along, but it is references to past dates that have already expired or that, that goal has been accomplished. And so I think there was a question as to whether should we keep that for uh, reference sake, continuing along in the, char in, in the charter, or is that something to consider to be revised? How on earth would you explain that to the people, what the purpose is? Because I don't understand what the purpose is. Why would you do it? I'm, and I don't, oh, wow. I'm neither for or against it. I just uh, don't get Could it. you wait until you're called on? Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, go ahead. But I, you know, otherwise we're in trouble. Okay. I'm happy to do that. Sure. I'm sorry. Go um, right ahead. So what is the purpose of this? What is it trying to accomplish? I don't get it. I, I think from the last Charter Review Committee, the, um, the, the, the original references to, for example, within five years, the city shall establish this particular goal objective was kept in as a point of reference. Whether I, I don't believe there's a requirement to do that. To keep it to keep the story of the no, historical point there of is reference. Not. There's not a requirement just make and, and there would be a history in our ordinances of the changes made. Correct. And there'll also be minutes from each of the charter review committees and there'll be the each each charter is kept and preserved through the process. So the question came as to does it get confusing when people are reading the charter that they're referencing something that has already been accomplished and is already finished and should we be looking at updating that language or is there a sense from the committee that you are interested in preserving that and I, I think that would be a, um, a more of a policy decision right John I mean for my part I'd be in favor of cleaning up the any obsolete provisions I mean this charter review only happens once every 10 years that's our chance to do that there is a historical record and um, I'd be interested in knowing and getting a list from staff as to what particular sections you think that might apply to Russ I'm in agreement with uh, with John I agree with John yeah. so I'll Corey I agree with John can I ask one question though yes okay. sir All right what does this kind of cleanup or housekeeping change have to go to the pub, pub the public yes. for vote as well Correct. so how does one package that so that it's clear just say these are housekeeping Issues. Yes. So, no, I mean, that's the thing. I did this for yes, you can. Yeah. You yes. Have to be able to, We've yeah. done that before. Yeah. And does I, that work? Yes. Oh, okay. And, yes. and I did it for Fort Myers Beach, their last revision. It was 17 amendments, and a lot of them were just little things, but, but they passed. People were able to pick out the difference between the ones that were yeah. important and the ones that weren't, with the help of the paper. <laughs> so we'll get a list, and then, uh, but I think we're in agreement. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry, Barbara. Did, no, no, are I'm you fine. in agreement? I just didn't get what the po point of it was, and now I think I do. Well, I'm fine. I'm fine with it. I'm not sure how we explain it. So, so staff, we, the next meeting, we'll have a list of those that we've identified that either have been accomplished or times expired on that, or right. it's no longer relevant. And then that would be the board's decision to look at those if there's any. We'll look concern. at those, and then we'll uh, take a vote. Okay. Is it possible to package those as one question on the um, the charter revision? questions you send out to the public as housekeeping? I think we have to uh, look and see what they are first. I doubt it. I, I, yeah, I, it, it, you get, you really, you're limited on your subject matter, so. And I think if they're referring to different sections, that they yeah. probably have okay. to be individual. And I, I don't think there are that many. We took some out before, I know. So, I don't think there are that many. Uh, section 15, first, in that section, it should be PAC, P-A-C, not packed. Yeah. Oh, yes. And, uh, all right, any beneficial ownership and any P-A-C, PAC, supporting a candidate must file within seven days of expenditure or a timely basis based on the election date i.e. expenditure of $500 must be reported within three days. I'm, I have a question. Uh, are there any penalties in this? Well, my, my, my thought on this was 
it needs to be reworded that the candidate will be the one filing the notice, not the way it's currently worded. It, it implies that it's the person giving the contribution. Right. Well, right. no one has any control over that person. And so we wouldn't have any control. We, the only controls are the candidate. So, but the question still remains, if someone violates it. What do you do? There's no penalty. You count on transparency and public oversight. That's the only thing that you have in that sort of thing. Yeah, there right. Is, there is no penalty. Well, I guess a bit. <clears throat> can I say cool. that? Yes, you may. I'm sorry. I should have asked. Uh, I guess the bigger question, that, and I raised the one about 15B, is, I mean, is there any? I'm not even sure I know the purpose of this, uh, given Citizens United that, you know, spending has been equated by the Supreme Court as equal to free speech. So, how can you even have any? rules on it to start. Well, and, and I, so I, we'll just we deal with that right now. The, the Citizen United case does not affect state and local um, spending limits. It was targeting the, the, the Federal uh, Election Campaign Act directly. Now, since that finding, there have been attempts to, by, by groups to apply it to state and local regulations, but no cases have come out saying that, that the extent of the Supreme Court's a decision extended that far. So at the moment, campaign standing limits at the state and local level are still in place. Um, and I think the remember the, the issue of that case is it, it gets it gets I'll, I'll, the the dicta the the comments in the case get overblown toward what the actual case resolved, and and that was about whether. A third part in that particular case, it was a third party who made a documentary, um, I believe it was against candidate Clinton. Was that to be considered towards the election contributions towards the other side? And in this, it was a third party altogether. And so there's there's a lot of factual different distinctions. And so far, none of the cases addressing the state level have have gone gone far enough to really affect us. So okay. campaign election would still apply here. I think, and I'm, I'm just think, thinking back, if we were to discuss the issue of penalties, that should probably be towards the eligibility of the candidate. Because really, the only thing you could do is to make someone ineligible by failing to follow those rules. But that's not in, that's in not, this. That's not in the current version, no. No. So I think we, oh, John? What's the origin of 15 relative to what's in here now? I, I'm, is this just someone, is this a suggestion coming from, from someone? Is this um, is just in addition to what's in here? Is this an effort to amend I, something in here? I've only seen about half these before today. Uh, I believe this section, this one, section 15, that's not referenced to B, this was a comment from the council. So these, these were comments received either through the one-on-one -on -one meetings we had, and then we had a, some, some folks on the committee emailed some questions to us as well to explore. So uh, the reason why it's labeled as B was because that was an additional comment received on that, that section of the code. So, the, so if, if in fact Citizens United does not apply, then I think the question is, should there be a full disclosure of both spending by the candidate on his campaign as well as dark money supplied by the PACs? The, the issue would be how do you, what jurisdiction, what control would the, the city be able to expend on, the, on the, those, that, those kind of funding? So I assume it'd be advertisements. It would uh, be the slicks. It would yeah. be the, it would the be. The large cards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, for the candidate that doesn't make a good presentation to the public, that the PAC gets behind him. You know, you throw the election into the November election where you got everything going on, and then the PAC simply put out a bunch of slicks mm -hmm. uh, just to get name recognition for voters going into the, into the ballot. I will research that issue because where I'm concerned is that um, Florida law has pretty pretty extensive regulation on PACs and their contributions, and we can't, 
we may be prohibited from duplicating those efforts. So let me look, take a look at that. Let me survey it very quickly, and I'll, I'll come back. And I'm also going to, based on our conversations, I'm going to, I'm going to look and see if I can find some samples of what people have put in as penalties for violations. Yeah, because, because if you that's have completely something absent. like this and don't have a penalty, yeah. so what? It would seem yeah. to me it would have to be against the candidate. I think you're yeah. right on that. Well, but there's not, you know, yeah. now but it's not even not in here either. either. Yeah. Could I ask a question that yes. in terms of current practice on this? Are our um, candidates for council, and that's really the only elected thing we do, isn't it, is the council part and the mayor, are they required to um, publicly um, reveal, uh, file somewhere what they're spending on their campaigns? Yes, they, they And they're required to spend to file who's donating to them? They do. So it seems to me the question here is what happens when an organization, whether it calls itself a PAC or a, you know, the local rotary or something, mm -hmm. or whatever it is, if they spend, and the word in the term in the, in the field is independently, so they're not coordinating with the candidate, that's how under um, Citizens United they've gotten away with so much stuff. This is independent if you're not coordinating. There doesn't seem to be any limit on the amount you can spend. Right. And if the candidate claims that it's independent, they're not doing it, they don't have any control over that group to force them to say. So I don't know, that's a really important question, I think, to look, is there any power that we- Where do they get the picture? Where do they get the comments? Where, you know? Well, I'm, I'm thinking specifically as in Citizens United, it's the people who are running ads against the candidate. Not necessarily for yeah, candidates. For the, That's yeah, the, for, against candidates, yeah. I could see a lot more scenarios where it's, there's a candidate against mm -hmm. who's not necessarily for one or depending on how many right. candidates there are on the other side, but they're they're simply against one candidate or an initiative. If it's a referendum initiative or something else. Well, I guess the problem I'm trying to address is the the problem we have in Bonita Springs with developers that get behind certain candidates and. Uh, all of a sudden, PAC money appears from some source in Tallahassee uh, where the PAC's located, uh, and it's not really known that that spending is really being done on behalf of a candidate. It's not a negative ad. It's, it, these, are, these are positive ads on behalf of a candidate. So that's why I'm raising the question, is there some way that we can get uh, disclosure of that uh, within the charter? I thought that there was a limitation. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go right Man. ahead. Go. Right. I thought there was like a, a limitation to each candidate locally. I mean, there is, there, there, there I mean, is a the there's under, a cap off. There is a the current one is, it's but it's balanced against the, the consumer price index. And a lot of a lot of communities and counties and stuff will put five hundred or a thousand dollars as, as a limit, and then you can go to the supervisor's website and those kinds where they're. Maybe they're doing publications, they'll be listed as in-kind, but they usually have to attribute the value to them as well. So you're saying these packs, like you're talking about locally? Well, sure. I will mean, influence, yeah. I mean, I don't know, I mean. Yeah, yeah the board, the Florida realtors, they, they oh, tend to okay. give a lot of money on projects that there are. There are certain projects here where, along Benita Beach Road, for example, where PAC money mm. suddenly appeared and. Uh, D developers will allow um, candidates to put their signs up on their properties, you know, where an individual voter may only have one piece of property, a developer may have multiple pieces of property, and larger pieces of property, they can have larger signs. I mean, there, it, it, I'm not denying that it absolutely does happen. The question is, what can we what do can we to? Do? What can we do it? about? That's all I'm asking. So you'll look I'll, into I'll that. I'll take a look into that. I grew up in Chicago around Chicago. Oh. <laughs> There's the explanation. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Uh, section 17, <coughs> look into instant runoff possibilities for races with multiple candidates. I would assume this is like Maine just had yeah. an election where you vote on three people and maybe number two gets the most votes. I. Uh, I don't know your, who contacts the uh, supervisor of elections to see about this. Um, we can have our city clerk contact the supervisor of elections and see what options are available. 
can I point out something that I think I remember reading this? Is that we, one of the suggested changes was to move from having someone have to get 50% of the vote to letting the person that got the largest vote. amount That's vote? That's because of me. Okay. So um, I guess there's the policy decision you have to make. Do you want to make sure that whoever serves as mayor or on the council, if there are multiple candidates, that someone is representing at least a majority of the population? Well, so I don't. ran against six men and got 48% of the vote and didn't get the job. Yeah. So after that, uh, it was changed because the six men, of course, got together against me, which is politics, which was fine. <laughs> and I lost by 250 votes because everybody thought I had been elected with 48% of the vote. And that's why that change is there. It's, so the change now is that you get elected with the most votes. You don't have to have 50 percent. Correct. I, I just didn't know. If you was. run against multiple candidates. Okay. Candidates. Well, and that's a lot of jurisdictions do that. It's the, que and the I'll basic tell you. question is. <laughs> I can tell you a lot about that, but yeah. not here. <laughs> yes, John. What is an instant runoff, just so I'm clear? Well, I, I, well my understanding is the current seven, uh, section 17, um, identifies the issue that the, the chair has pointed out. The highest vote getter is deemed to be elected. What well, I, I believe the proposal is would be the, f the top two vote getters would go to a runoff. No. No, is that? Okay. No, that's not the proposal, I don't think. The, I, I just I assumed a runoff was there was something. In some Maine, change. they had an election where uh, three people were running for an office, let's say. Or maybe it could have been four or five. But you vote for three. And whoever gets the most votes among those three is elected. Oh, they have the runoff. That's, that's referred they to have the runoff at the same yeah. time they so have the election. Do they prioritize, say, I vote for this one as one, two, yes, and three? And yes, yes. Oh. That's called weighted voting. Yes. And the way they do that is they're trying to say that Sometimes people say, this is my first choice, but that's my last choice, so I'd really like to be able to, Correct. to wait that. It's a, um, it was a very popular way in small towns, but, and that's probably why Maine does it. It's, Maine, yep, Maine it's just harder. started it, it, and there's some other jurisdictions, yeah. I think, that have it, but I remember reading about Maine. Yeah, yeah it's a very standard. Well, we will, we, we'll talk to the supervisor about that because they may... Yeah, I think that's the supervisor. That, that may be another. Assumed. That may be another issue. If you're unwilling to uh, to deal with that, then we would have, we can always conduct our own election. There's no obligation for us to work through the supervisor. But um, let's see if we can get some comments from them on that. Okay. But, but yeah, weighted voting is that. That now I understand what. Yeah. What I'm. Uh, okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry that if we're on the same topic. I can't do this. Is there any indication? Um, other than back in, historically, do that we get multiple co candidates for these positions? I mean, last I time most of the council that. ran unopposed. So I don't know whether well, I don't know. So this was the first looking time. For a problem, or is there actually a problem? This was the first time. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it might be that's why we had seven people running right. for mayor. Yeah. I don't think you'll find that many again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They've seen it work. So you'll have the supervisor of election. Yeah, we'll reach out to them on that issue. Section 19, composition, oh, I'm sorry, compensation for city council members and when and how they should get an increase since COLA for employees has been removed. Request research of other local mu municipalities. Suggested average of employee increases annually. So, Chair, as a background, yes. this came up because the city has moved away from um, COLA increases and we have merit increases. So the question did come, is there, is there a possibility that an employee may not <coughs> receive an increase? And, and that is a possibility if based on performance. Um, so I think the question was, is how do other jurisdictions address this issue? Um, are, are other jurisdictions also having a COLA and a merit and, and, what, and, how they're, and how they're determining that? And 
um, if, if for that year the, the staff is not getting a COLA, which we've moved away from, what would be the mechanism for council members? That was the question that came up. Couldn't you have the COLA for council members and the other for the employees? Mm -hmm. Isn't that done in other places? It, I, I think the, is it the question is COLA only, COLA for the, the council members only if the employees get it as well? I mean, that's, so it's the, the linking of the two? Uh, I think that's how it reads in the yes. current. It says that I'm, we have I'm not asking that. Yeah. I'm asking if we can have a COLA for the council and then not have it for the employees. Have whatever the merit or whatever you have for the employees. Yeah, you can, you can do it either way. Russ. Can you define COLA for me? <laughs> oh, co cost, cost of living, of living. Cost of living increase. Thank so you. it's it's based on an index. Okay, sorry. But I'll I'll point out that the um, cost of living index that's referenced there is none referenced in section 19. So again, that's one of those situations where it's up to interpretation. So you need to say which cost of living index you're going to do. In my my experience is has been looking at many charters that charters in communities where the council is receive some compensation, that that compensation is either set or adjusted annually based on some form of uh, cost of living allowance. I have also seen numerous ones where they have tied themselves to their employees. So if the council is making a decision that for certain reasons, budgetary reasons that they, the employees cannot get a COLA, then they do not get a COLA. So, so those are just the variety of options I've seen. And there's been situations where there's no COLA and they just adjust it themselves, but then that puts the council in a situation they never like to have. Yeah, to you don't like to, to vote for that, reasons. Right. Russ, <laughs> who wants to do and that? And the merit um, piece is how, who judges that? Like a merit, like are they, sure. are they fulfilling their job description? Are Correct. they? Correct. I mean, who? Annually, there's goal setting with the individual employees and their manager, and through that, um, there, there's a rating system, and then based on the amount of budget appropriated for staff at that at that time, there's a decision at to at, as to weight what that increase might be, um, you know, the possibility two, three, four percent in that in in that, and that's based solely on their performance. Now, we have not completely eliminated COLA, and periodically there'll be um, market rate studies as to where the city's employees fall within our neighboring jurisdictions and across the state. And at that point, if it's determined that we're not at market rate, there is a combination of COLA and performance measures to bring the employees back up to market rate. If you recall, that sort of happened during the downturn in 2008, and then yeah. we had a market study after that. Yeah. yeah. John? Yeah, I was curious what's happening in recent times here. Since this, since the charter says that the cost of living adjustment is at the same time and manner as for the city employees, and if you're telling us that the city's gotten away from a COLA adjustment for employees, and I don't know what, I'd be interested in know, knowing for what period of time that's been the case, and has it been the case that the mayor and the council members have not been receiving a COLA increase for a period of time? We can, we can provide you the data of when we, it's, um, it's periodically when the market rate adjustment's done and when the last time the COLA is. We can look at when we received, and then we can give you a chart of when the mayor and council received increase, coal increase as well. We can bring that back to the next okay. meeting. And I'm not looking for a, a big historical analysis. Here. <laughs> I'm just trying to understand if that's yeah, what, been what's going on in, in recent right. years that sure. there's no adjustment. Any comment? Just, just a comment. I guess I feel a little uncomfortable with uh, council being tied to the merit performance of the rest of the organization. Somehow that just doesn't sit well. <laughs> The council is not tied to the merit. Well, here, that's a suggestion. This, last sentence, <laughs> this last sentence, it is, that's what that suggests, suggests to me. In the, in the proposed, not the existing. No, I, well, now yeah, they get an increase. Jackie, could I make a comment about COLAs in general? Would that be all right? Sure. The cost of living adju adjustments, which I assume we're cut to have either have more control over people getting raises based on merit or to save money, but really a cost of living exam adjustment 
all that does is keep you in the same position you are. And if we don't do that, what we're basically doing is cutting the pay of our employees, and that's the real result of it. And the result for the for the um, ledger, the council and the mayor is they never like to vote um, increases for themselves. But if you let this happen and not let it raise with the cost of living over time, who's going to want to do the job? I mean, it, it costs almost as much money as you're paid to do this job, and we expect an enormous amount out of our council and mayor. I'm always impressed with how much time and effort they put into this. So I think there's that there has to be some way that we come up with that you adjust this amount that this 20,000 and 15,000 that is states in here, I don't know where it is now, and that would be an interesting um, figure to have. I think you're right. This, this is what it was whenever this was written, but assuming there were some 3% cost of living adjustments, that that would. Um, so we'll get, get that information. Get that information, but I think it's really important that we consider finding some way to adjust the pay for the council and the mayor. Um, and I agree with you. I think I'm think i sure if we don't, they will. Yeah. Well, well except they don't I mean, like to do that. I mean, they get to look at all of our, you know, our things, and I, I would think that they would. Well, I would think they would, and I, but I agree. I, I feel with you about tying it to merit. Their merit <coughs> measurement is the vote. That's how you get the merit oh, of an elected yeah, official. And so it, it seems to me that some way of doing it as a percent increase that right. you tie that's to why the coal is yeah, there. The coal. Right. That's, I mean, they have a wonderful history. It right. solved a lot of problems. Goals. I would like <coughs> yes. to ask a question. Uh, yep. How many cities actually put the council and mayor's salaries in their charters? It seems to me like the ones I am familiar with, uh, those compensation levels are done by ordinance. and. Uh, I think if, well, maybe, maybe it occurred during the summer when a lot of people weren't here, but there was a tremendous amount of public input and uproar for the um, uh, compensation increases put into the, by the city of Naples mm -hmm. uh, for both the mayor and the council. You know, I think they're, they uh, voted in a ordinance of at least 100% increase. Uh, but that gave the opportunity for a lot of public input on it as well. So I gather that they wouldn't have had those limits in the charter. So I think I'm troubled by the fact that we state specific dollar amounts in the charter, in the charter and would we be better off uh, saying that these are subject to council votes uh, and go through the ordinance process? I would have to disagree with that. Okay. Uh, I think having them tied to the COLA uh, makes it the way all the employees and everybody else have been getting it. And I don't, and they would never get the money that uh, they get in Naples from uh, putting it. Uh, that where they do it by ordinance. You're voting for your own pay increase? It, let, me, let me, I'll clarify a little thing since I was looking at the Naples charter because of the height issue. I, anyway, Naples does do it by ordinance, but it is in their charter. So they may nor all charter amendments occur through an action of, or at least initiated by the councils. So even the charter, what this body will do at the end of its service will come up with a list of recommendations. Those recommendations will go to the council. The council will ultimately decide which recommendations are up for a vote, and they will adopt them by ordinance. But Florida law does allow for charters to be amended in, I think, like five or six different ways by ordinance at any time. So they can change, they can eliminate departments, and I believe they can change the pay is one of those things. But, but traditionally, the salaries are usually tied to uh, the charter. Uh, I believe that because the city of Sanibel does not, or did not, they may have changed this year, um, pay their, their representatives on their council, that they did a pretty good exhaustive uh, survey of the local communities, and I'll see if I can get a handle on that. Because I, I think one thing that may be missed in this is that every new council member 
whether it's now or 10 years from now, starts at 15,000, and then the COLA starts. This is not a moving number. Oh, it isn't. Oh, I didn't oh, know that. That's, wow. why, ah. oh. that's why I'm troubled by putting a specific number in the chart. But I, I was that asking Arlene, because I think that, that's the way I read this, and that's, and that's the way I believe it's been interpreted in other places as well. So that's something we can come back and, and look. But yeah, ultimately, like they're going to really have to vote on up. a change to the charter, so they're going to be voting for an uh, increase in pay no matter what. So they're, they can't get away from it, because even your recommendations require their consent. Jackie, if I could, one more question. Yes. If they vote on it, can they vote on it for immediate adoption? In Congress, you can't vote on a pay raise until an election has intervened, because that becomes one of the electoral checks on Congress and paying itself more. But is there any rule like that in local or state? They're all now? millionaires in Congress. But uh, <laughs> they, Even they, with or without uh, the pay raise. <laughs> they can make it immediate, but in past practices and charter committees that I've sat on, they have usually done it to the next election. After the election. It's, that's just a nice check and to have the people. Any other questions on this? Yeah. They'll look that up. All right. We'll do uh, two more sections, if it's all right with you. Uh, 21C, wording of the 180 days is confusing and what better, well, more plain language. <coughs> Positive, not negative would be good. Can you talk about that, Derek? Yes, if you'd like, we can, I can come up with some, some language for the next meeting. That would be good. That would that, be maybe great. Maybe that's just be the easiest way to do it. Yes, that okay. would be very good. Thank you. Maybe doing it as a positive, not a negative, would okay. be helpful. Gotcha. All right. Section 24. Add discussion meeting to allow council members to meet on subject matter and discuss with no voting. Meetings will be recorded, determine minimum and maximum attendees allowed, and the minutes would be approved by city council. I don't, can you talk about sure. so that, Arlene? Yes, yeah, so the feedback that was received from council on this one was is um, shortly after a, a, a larger new turnover in our council happened, many folks were trying to get caught up on specific issues and they worked with the former city attorney to create a, a budget and finance or special review committee where it was sort of a, a subcommittee of the council um, that they were they discussed where topics that might come up that everything would be recorded, um, but they would have, be able to have some more free discussion and explore items in more depth and then bring back their findings to council where any where any specific vote would take so there would be no vote taken in these individual meetings so more like a subcommittee to explore deeper into certain issues that might be larger at task um, and i think um, that was created by a, a resolution that committee, it's the, committee. yeah that, um so the they call it different things in different communities I, what they call it different things in different communities like i just learned at cape coral they call it the committee of the whole where they allow their council to show up it's not an action item agenda in lee county they call it a workshop agenda i think in astero they call it a workshop agenda but it's a what's what's discussed here under 24 is is a sec, effectively a meeting of the council to discuss things in a, in a more workshop session that is not an official um meeting where they can take any action now the requirements that to be recorded that there be minutes all that's required already under state law um so no changes would be required. What they, what they had done is they adopted changes to their rules of procedure where they formalized the process for having those workshops. But as far as charter amendments, I don't, I don't think that anything is necessary. Um, but they already do that, don't they? They we already do do that. several workshops that I've uh, <laughs> yeah. well, one, don't one comment, I don't know if any of them mentioned it. One thing that is, uh, everything else in section 24 is it's pretty standard equipment, 12 hours notice, special meetings, um, 12, hours, 12 hours notice, yeah. it's pretty good. Emergency situations, you might, you might have a very rare situation where it's less than that. The Florida Attorney General has generally said 24 hours is fine. We, we have rules for hurricanes and things like that, so I don't think that 
changing that as necessary. One thing that may want to be looked at is the council meeting regularly at least once every month doesn't allow people to take vacations. <laughs> I'm throwing this out there because they, they probably wouldn't, but a lot, of, a lot of communities take a month off in the summertime and obviously snowbirds enjoy that because nothing's happening while they're gone, but that's one thing that this charter provides that other charters in the community don't have. Russ? You're talking about the city council or? City council. Specifically? Specifically. Okay. And so, can you give us the places where that's done? Not now, but. Sure. So just to clarify, for this particular question, I believe the, that the question was, is do, does the, should it be a mentioned that this subcommittee could be created by council where, and should it, the other question I think was asked is, should it be limited to a number of, of attendees of the council to be there? Can it be one or two? I mean, it could be two or, um, or more, and, or, and should it even be referenced? That was some of the feedback we received during our one-on-one -on -one meeting. But, but there is a pro pro process for them to do that right now, and they have done that on specific budget issues. And in, in, in yes. those meetings, uh, are there presently a quorum of the council attending those meetings? Not always. But they could? But they could. We didn't, we didn't, it was never they limited. They don't vote, so it doesn't make any difference, does right. it? it? It never limited to the number of council members who could attend. And, they, and it was recorded and a staff member was present. Madam Chairman? Yes. Just a question. Thank you. If, uh, if, it, if it's currently being done now, why do we have to change it in the charter? What will be the value of doing that? Sure, I, I think the comment was, should it be referenced in the charter that these type of meetings can happen since it's, I think it's not one of the defined meetings of the council because this would be specifically council members. And it, it would, I think it's more of a policy decision as whether it should. So we can feeling. vote against doing that and they could still have them. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. If you don't, at this point in time, it's not a required that it be in the right. charter. And not, more than, not more than two of them can ever get together and talk about city business without it being advertised, without it being noticed and having the ability of the public to observe and with minutes taken. So they really, there's nothing they can do about it. I mean, that's the requirement of state law. So if we were, were, this would be something in addition to that. I thought, I'm sorry. I'm they not, don't, no. but in this meeting, they don't, uh, they don't advertise it or anything. But, but if they discuss issues that could come up at a, at a future, it, no, they have to notice it. But if they, if they discuss issues that could be on the city council, then they ha it has to meet all those three legs of the stool. Everything that, the, that it was just stated is done for these smaller Oh, meetings. okay, So okay. they're advertised, we post the meeting, minutes are taken, those minutes are approved at the next regular city council meeting, and the public, we have it in a, a, a conference room where the public can observe the meeting happening as, as it's happening. Thank you. Is it all right if we adjourn at this time? Or do you wanna go on? It's all right with me. I'd like to go on. If Let's we could. get a couple like more to go on. <laughs> okay. okay, then we'll go on. I think the next two items, I didn't want to go on because those are my items. Oh, these, I know. I these, know. Are, these are just our sort of housekeeping items. I mean, uh, it was just a question as to, uh, I think it's, we incur a fair amount of cost publishing these notices in newspapers and so forth. And with the newspapers moving to a digital format, is it possible to put these notices in a digital format? So there is, um, we're required for certain notices, particularly ordinances and, and particularly display ads, which are the expensive ones when we do land use changes where we actually show like a half page, it's gotta have a map. Those are required by law to be advertised in a newspaper of general circulation. Um, by the charter law or no, by, by city? state law? State, by state law. law. Yeah. Okay. Now we we'll get to that at a, at a later point, but we there is a and I'll, I'll circulate it to everyone. There is a state law detailing how we adopt ordinances and resolutions. We have to follow that. A lot of that has been ported over in different language into our charter. It, it lends itself to confusion if the two are not exactly. identical. 
and there's no reason for them to be identical because one is absolutely controlling and the other one could just lead us into trouble. Um, but we are required to advertise only in those situations. Other meetings where we, we just want to have a discussion meeting, then we're required to notice reasonably. That does not require to be published. It can be posted. It could be on the website. And Florida law requires that every publisher who, who takes official legal notices from local governments also has to put it on, a web, on their website, if they have a website. Uh, but unfortunately, because of that publication requirement, we can't bypass the newspaper publication in lieu of even our own website. Um, and I suspect that will be, continue to be the case for some period of time, um, because every community lobby. may have <laughs> different websites that people get their information on and the legislatures in their infinite wisdom says, well, the newspaper is, is something that's still out there. Yeah. So. And 29C. Uh, I'm just, that was mine as well. It was just a question as to why do ordinances go effective 30 days after I have, I have an opinion on this, and this is an opinion that was shared from the, for, the former city attorney. She, she said, if there's one thing you change, add that one in. Um, the, the issue of why it was 30 days, I don't know. I suspect that the reason was just to give more notice to the general public. However, of course, at that point they have notice, but there's nothing to be done about it. And but it was, also, doesn't it give time for the city to get ready to do whatever they're going to have to do possibly, with the ordinance? Possibly, but let me give you a couple of uh, examples, real, real life examples. We have situations where we may want to change a land development regulation or something else. Maybe we want to address in a particular emergency um, that there are, there are numerous requirements that we adopt certain things by ordinance. So uh, resolution, Maybe one thing, and you know, for today is talk like a pirate day. You know, there's they have a certain level of distinguishment, and then there may be a res an ordinance we want to put in saying no fires because of a, a, a ban, burn ban. That goes into effect 30 days. There's no there's no flexibility in that because it's in the charter. But couldn't it, we have emergency ordinance? Yeah, the emergency couldn't we change? Yeah. But but then the question becomes, what's an emergency? And a fire. What might a fire would be an emergency, but but maybe a land development regulation might be something that's considered emergency by many people because once that project is completed, it's there for all time, and there's so it's a flexibility. What's argument. an emergency? And the the other the other part of this that you know many many city councils when they're dealing with something that has an implementation period, they'll build 30 days, 60 days, 90 days for implementation. Um, this takes away that flexibility. But the other part of it is there is a requirement in the charter that we advertise after we've adopted something. So every ordinance that's going to be adopted gets advertised in the paper. Land use regulations initiated by the city get, get advertised twice in the paper, plus there's public meetings. And now we've added in our charter a third advertisement on, on the back end. Yes. And what happens if that advertisement is missed? What happens if the city, someone had accidentally fails to advertise it. Does that mean that the ordinance and everything in it is invalid? What if we only discover that two years down the line? So we're adding an additional cost by the advertisement itself. We're not, I'm not sure what the public policy is for having that, that post-mortem on the issue. It's already in effect, it's going to be in effect in 30 days, but you've, you've built in some potentials where you could trip yourself up and what the intent of the, of the community is. So. If it, was up, if it was my recommendation, it would be to take it out take it. entirely. <laughs> Madam Chair. Yes, John. You know, I share your view. I think this, this is an unusual provision, and I think it's something we ought to look at. I'd also, I, I, I look back and notice that this was a recommendation <laughs> of the uh, Charter Review Committee 10 years ago that this provision be changed and that if, if these numbers are right, it lost it went to a vote of the public and lost by a narrow margin, 53 to 46 percent. And I'd be interested to know what sort of thinking went on or, or explanation as to why this, you know, was a recommendation back then. So, you know, we could take a look at that and determine if, in fact, we were to recommend a change here that we would uh, maybe 
handle it a little differently handle and it differently be in a position and, to, to yeah. more effectively um, communicate what we're, what we're trying to do. Um, and I guess now I'm wondering if about this third notice you described and whether that's something we ought to be taking a look at. I don't know if that's on the list here or not. But that but, should be uh, on the list. Um, and, and, you know, if there's a, uh, the, the other thing I think we might want to consider is if, you know, if, um, you know, maybe 30 days isn't right, maybe 10 days is adequate, you know, and would give, uh, would, would help uh, achieve some benefit, right. um, but still, uh, you know, maintain an opportunity for appeals or, or other actions. But those are my thoughts on this. Thank item. you. Anyone and, else? And, and Chair, just to clarify yes. the question that um, Mr. Corey had regarding to the um, the advertisement, not all are required to be advertised in the newspaper. No. What we can do is bring back to you the ones that are required and look if see if that's something you want to have a differential on as well. That's because good. We, that's we good. do have, with new media formats, we do have a lot of outreach through our social media avenues, our website, and, and we also have places where you can get links to updates on meetings and, and opportunities to participate. Might I ask a clarifying question that I'm not yes. sure about? Um, do I understand you correctly that if we were to eliminate this, the council would still have the flexibility to add a 30 or 90 or whatever day if there were some compelling reason to need lead-in time for the public to be able to yeah. Just, so, mo so we reason, wouldn't be yeah. eliminating the possibility. We'd just be leaving it to the discretion Correct. of the council. Yeah. Okay. Correct. Okay. That's why I wanted to make sure that was there. Section 33, comment one, remove indefinite term and replace with a specific term. And comment two, <laughs> wanted no changes in this. So let me get to 33. It's the managers. Thirty-three. This is the uh, city manager. What did remove indefinite term? I don't see any reason. The, the for that. first, oh, the first. John, yeah. no, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, I apologize. I talked out of turn. I was just going to say the first sentence uh, indicates that the city council, by a majority vote of its total membership, shall appoint a city manager for an indefinite term. Right. I think the, the, the request was to take out indefinite term. Correct. And replace with a specific term. And or this, it, I'm sorry. And the second comment from someone was to no changes. So we'll talk about the first comment. John? Yeah, this I remember coming up uh, and with the prior city manager and then maybe with the current city manager that they get, people got tangled up on the issue of extending the contract and the inability to identify what would be an appropriate contract term or can there be a contract term. And I was quite surprised to find that there was language in the charter that had this indefinite term provision um, which seemed to suggest you know certainly the the city manager is works uh, is employed at the will of the council but that you know there was not a, a there was some confusion about whether you could establish a five-year term a contract term or a one-year contract term and so forth so I'm interested in hearing if that I mean Arlene, your thoughts on that? I just remember when Carl was here, there was uh, a confusion, I thought, at the council level and maybe with the public on what this meant and how it might have tied the hands of the council. And it seems to me that um, a better approach would be uh, to uh, allow for a negotiated term of the contract between the city and the manager without uh, specifying either a fixed term or an indefinite term in the charter. 
So the process of the discussion that came up is that the the conditions of the employment, such as um, the setting of the salary and, and items of that, was set for a term limit through the contract, but the actual appointment of city manager was an indefinite term. So that, that was what was dis discussed through the process with, um, with the former city manager and myself as we reviewed it, um, that certain uh, aspects of the employment could be worked out through the actual contract, but the term was set through the charter. That no, I'm just making it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, it, it's correct. The, the issue, um, for instance, go, I went to check the language on the, the city attorney. It does no reference to term whatsoever. So the issue is uh, maybe there's a concern from someone in the public or in the council that the <clears throat> perception is that this is an indefinite job period without tying it to a specific contract. But if there's a contract, then that contract would come up for review right, depending on right. its terms. And if there couldn't be an agreement reached on the contract, it wouldn't mean that the city manager is now out of a job. It would just mean that they will continue until a new contract is resolved. So that's the only thing I can think of what the language could have been intended for. But, but there's also language set forth to remove the city manager and the same provision yeah. as well, regardless of a contract. Yeah, I, th I think the wording in the present charter is just fine. Me too. Any other comments on this? I, I have comments on the next, which is change wording to shall have the right to participate in non-policy discussions and at the invitation of the council policy matters and I'd like to speak on that the manager is really the professional and is very responsible and knows what policies are going to how they're going to affect the city this the council has always been the group that votes on things they want to get an accomplishment. And so they think it's an accomplishment and they're for it and that's fine. The city manager in these policies knows what could happen from her, her or his experience. That something could be undermined by doing this, something could be happen doing that. And they have the expertise because that's why they're there to discuss policy. And it seems to me that you're cutting off your nose to spite your face when on certain issues you don't allow the city manager to speak in regard to the policy. And I don't think it should be left to the council not to have a representation of someone who knows what the policy will do in the future. And so I am against that change. I am also against it. I agree. Is it? Yes. I'm, I'm just asking, I, I'm not sure I understood what this change. Was this change adding a limit on the ability of the yes. manager to participate yes. as opposed to I on policy, yeah. yes. I sort of saw that as an expansion that maybe she couldn't talk on it now. So no, no, no. no. That, so I'm glad. Yes, I would agree with you completely. I think that you are absolutely right, and that's what a strong um, city manager that's kind of government is supposed that. to do. Right. So. All right. So we will. Can I have a vote on that? Since we agree, we can get rid of that. I agree for both 33 and 36. For 33 and 36. John, you had something. You yeah, I, I agree on 36. Okay, let's vote General. on 36. 36, 36 C. I All agree. in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. <clears throat> Will be eliminated. We were voting to eliminate this, yes. Right. Okay. Section 33 remove indefinite term and replace with specific term. Uh, all those in favor of removing the indefinite term and replacing with a specific term, say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Aye. 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 Okay. I think we might have a comment. No. 
Oh, John. I, I, Madam Chair, I just am not sure what that meant by a specific term in this particular. Uh, but we can bring it up again. I mean, I don't know, frankly, I guess this is a bigger question in terms of expanding on this list as we go down the road. Um, I'm, you know, I might, for example, say I think the indefinite term language needs to change, but I, would, I wasn't in favor of uh, replacing it with a specific term because I'm not sure what that means either at this point. So, uh, you know, with the you caveat can bring it that back we'll, up. we'll talk about it again. You can bring it back up. <clears throat> Section 46F, and this just says do research to see if this is excessive. <clears throat> I have to find that. 46F. The city charter hereby provides for a legal debt limit which caps the amount of outstanding long-term liabilities to 10% of the assessed value of the property within the city. And there was discussion that I heard that it might be too excessive in that we have such a higher uh, assessment of property in the city now than we had, say, 10 years ago. Is this a usual thing in, uh, in a charter Derek? It, it's common. Um, it, I cannot recall for the life of me what, what some of the neighboring ones are, but I, I suspect it's in the neighborhood of 5 to 10 percent. Um, I checked briefly because I still had Naples up. It does not have one at all. Um, but we can get those, that information to you. If that's something, Good. If, if we're talking yeah. about readjusting it accordingly. Yes. yes. We'll hold that off until you give us. Can I ask you that he gets something yeah. else too with that? Could you find out where we are at the moment in terms of the 10%? Is our debt limit coming close to that? Are we way under it or what? I mean, you need to know, you need to leave your government with enough flexibility to perform. And I just don't have any clue where we are there. So in order to have a logical, I mean, a reasonable discussion about it, I need to know whether 10% yeah. is leaving us lots of flexibility or not enough. Right. Since we may not have an ability to deal with future hurricanes because right. taxes haven't been increased. Right. right. Then that's probably a very good idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're very right. And uh, floods too without the hurricane. Okay, so we'll get research on that. 47. Change from three to five years, I have to see. Shall be oh, deemed abandoned, the appropriation, if three years pass. They want it if five years passes. I, I don't know why that would be. I would assume that part of the reason is election control. When you have an election that's every four years, uh, or terms that are four years, you actually have elections every two years. If you make it five years before it exp ex this spending authority that you haven't used expires, you can have two elections in between of people that don't want to do that and it doesn't expire. You've got to positively pass something to undo it. So ordinarily it seems to me a term like that having to do with expenditure ought to be tied to the electoral ability to hold their elected officials accountable, accountable through election. And so when I looked at this, it seemed to me that three was trying to keep underneath the four years and allow election to have effect, and the five years was um, more of a problem. Because if there is the potential of something um, lapsing, they can always pass it again. I mean, it's not like if they, if they haven't expended this money and the three years are up, they have to st not spend it. They just have to have a majority of the council still willing to do so. Well, I, and I, and um, on that last point, before I, I'm I'm wondering about how this has been interpreted, what its history was, because there's a budget passed every year. Yeah. And clearly, if we went, they have to pass a budget no matter what. So the the expenditure would be allocated every year, and therefore, if it's not. Does it have an automatic 
allotment? No, no, it, no it does no. not. So if it, if it hasn't, it would be something with, during the budget process, we would identify to council that it's been encumbered for the past three years. Are you wanting it to, you know, continue to be encumbered in the capital, in the well, CIP? And my, my, my point is, I don't think you can do that. If, if this language stays in the way it is, it's gone. The appropriation's right. gone. Now, we, we have a five-year state-mandated capital improvement plan, so the five-year absolutely makes sense. But once you've already, under the state law, once you've already identified something under your five-year capital improvement plan, you have to undertake it in those five years. That's, and the reason they did that is because a lot of your state funding, particularly for roads, is tied to similar five-year models. So when you put an appropriation, said we've set aside money to spend money on this, and then we go and shop around for grants from various agencies, whether state or federal, they want to see that you have it. And if they see that it's in your capital improvement plan, then they know you're going to do it. And so your project can be prioritized as one that is legitimate. I'm actually now having actually not really thought about this until the conversation came up from Ms. Craig mentioning it. I'm concerned that this language as it is cannot be reappropriated even if the council wanted to because they have to reappropriate everything every year anyway. And so this, this provision would have no purpose if it wasn't to be interpreted as automatically kicking it out. And why wouldn't you? What if, given FEMA as a good example, we have major stormwater issues, we may want to have an item fully funded so that we, we can get matching grants for six years. I mean, because if, if it's such a big expenditure that the city cannot possibly do it on its right. own initiative, what would be the purpose of putting any limitation on it? And I believe when we had the discussion one-on-one, -on -one, the concern did come from FEMA-based funding in the future, depending on when the funding comes and it's the expenditure plan for with contributions each year. That was, I think, one, part of our one-on-one. -on -one. We're talking about the reimbursements you're receiving and then the projects, with the LMS projects as well, what was the basis of it. But during the budget process, we I've advised council of these projects and, um, and then when they approve the new budget is when they have adopted that project back in or they've decided to decline that project madam chair yes question um, what's meant by appropriation then I mean I, I uh, you know that suggests to me that th there's a you know money's being set aside but then if after three years it hasn't been either dispersed or encumbered um, that could yeah, right. It, I know it, what disbursement would mean, but I'm not sure what encumbered would mean because it's clearly, if it's been appropriate, it's been, in some way, it's been encumbered because so it's set aside for non other uses. But if if someone was to in, interpret it as encumbered means that it's. It, it's. I believe it's referring, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it's referring to the grant identified project. So if we enter into a contract and we know we are to receive community development block grant funds within the fiscal year or when the state the state disbursement happens, we're encumbering those funds. We, we apply annually for, uh, for example, um, water patrols, um, extra patrols. We, during the budget process, we encumber that we're, we're going to receive a 50-50 match, so we place our match in the CIP and then we expect that the, that match will come back to us during the point when it's dispersed to us in the process. All right, Madam Chair, I, I guess for my part, I don't want to be precipitous here. It yeah. seems like there's a little more to this issue than at first uh, blush for me, so I'd certainly like to learn more Thank about you. it from staff. Could you also find out, is it like a reserve <sighs> fund? Is it like a reserve fund, do you think? It's not. I, 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 would, yeah, I would assume it's not our reserve fund because Correct. we have reserve funds, and those are fully funded every uh, year. This, this is encumbered. No, yeah. 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 These are allocated to specific projects. Right. Isn't that what a reserve fund is? No. Reserve fund you can use when I think well, we'll have, the hurricane or I think we'll have to go like back. Like one for your roof. You can this, only use it for the roof. This, is, this, okay. this is tied back to the original. This looks like this is tied back from the original um, special act and the creation of the city. And a lot of that language is carried over from ever, other special acts. Yeah. Um, okay. And so I bet if I did some digging, I could find out where this, this originally right. came from. So I'll, I'll just look and see if I can get an answer what the right. intent of this was. Uh, because I don't think it was ever intended to say that we couldn't fund projects beyond three years. I, I think it was intended to keep people from stockpiling money away for a project they had never had any intention of moving on or something to that extent. Good. Thank you. Nice little changes. 
Ask the supervisor of ele elections if the ballot will read the changes as <coughs> one. Well, it's going to probably be one, one thing. It'll probably be released by section number. Yeah, by section. But we'll ask. 56. Review communities with more expansive ethics codes, such as Tallahassee and Naples, and recommend adding the following three items to the charter. I count one, two, three, four, I think five, six. Uh, I, Madam Chairman, I would make a suggestion that this yeah. could get into a long discussion. Yeah, I think this is going to be a long discussion. I think so, too. So I, I really think we should uh, so move to way. adjourn. Would All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? I will also send out to everyone the state ethics code so you have some opportunity to look at what the state laws on, on ethics are ahead of the next conversation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. And for the record, our, our next meeting is March 11th at, at two, uh, Monday, Monday, so. Monday, March 11th. <laughs>